Uh, yes, I'm ready now. Okay. <laughs> so Professor Alvin Noe will be speaking, uh, presenting a paper entitled The Writerly Attitude. Alvin. Greetings, greetings, everyone. Uh, hello. Um, I'm very grateful to be invited uh, to participate in this celebration of Bert's work and, and life, uh, this chance to express our admiration for him. Uh, so that's something that I will cherish. Um, I was not, like many of you have been his students, I, have, I was never his student, at least in any formal sense, but it's hard for me to conceive that my debt to him could be greater if I had been uh, on so many dimensions, uh, philosophically, but I feel Bert has been a source of teaching me how to be a colleague and how to be a teacher um, and maybe even how to be a person. Uh, so yeah, it's a uh, real thrill, real thrill to do this, to be here now. Um, my topic today isn't really on one of Bert's topics, um, but you'll see, as is so often the case with my work of the time in my life that I've been exposed to Bert, I veer, I veer like you know, a planet moving around it, its, its primary source of orbit, I, I veer to Bert, so Bert's, Bert's all over this. Um, but there's one, one remark I wanted to make. Um, one of the interesting things that I encountered when I audited lectures that Bert gave on Merleau Ponty 12 years ago or so, and I'm sure many of you in this room know exactly what I'm talking about, Bert combines this wonderful mix of the open-minded and the flexible with the rigidly dogmatic. <laughs> and, he, and, and it shows up in all sorts of amusing ways. So for, but one of the ways that, in which it shows up yeah. when he's teaching uh, the phenomenology of perception is that he doesn't just simply invite students to skip over certain chapters like the preface or the discussion of sexuality or the discussion of language, but he insists on it. <laughs> he says he requires the students that they don't read these sections. And the only reason I mention this now is because uh, I think that the, the paper which I'm going to present to you uh, is something that I wouldn't have written if I hadn't disobeyed his command mm -hmm. and read Merleau-Ponty's chapter on language. Um, uh, that said, I have designed this presentation to last about 30 minutes in the hopes that um, we could have time for a discussion. <coughs> Sometimes philosophical or conceptual questions dress up in the garb of historical ones. The question, what is life, for example, may disguise itself as a question about life's origin, about what happened, say, when the lightning struck the primordial ooze. My topic today is like this. When and why do we as a culture or as a species start using written language? But my concerns are not really historical. What I really want us to think about now is what is writing and what is its relation to speech or to language more generally. And my broader project here, um, the, the project from really just beginning, is that of framing something like what I would call an inactive or a phenomenological approach to language and linguistic experience. And the central orienting idea of such an approach is that it would be one that views language as a style of active involvement with our lives and worlds. But my focus today, now, is language and writing. Um, how are things with acoustics? Can you hear me in the back? Yeah, is it good, this tone of voice? Not going too fast? Language is a topic very familiar to philosophers in all traditions. Writing, in contrast, is almost entirely neglected in the analytic tradition. Almost, but not entirely. Frege invented a system of writing he called the Begriffschrift, or concept script, whose purpose was to do a better job making explicit the real structure of thoughts and their logical relations, a better job than conventional writing. Logic and mathematics required this, Frege believed. And Wittgenstein, whose preoccupations were more overtly philosophical than Frege's, argued in the Tractatus that a proposition, a Phrygian thought, let's say, is the propositional sign thought in its projective relation to the world. 
Wittgenstein didn't pay much attention, I think, to the distinction between a spoken propositional sign and its written equivalent. But he is convinced, like Frege, that philosophical clarity can be achieved by, by deploying a more perspicuous method of writing. And this idea that philosophy should try to make übersichtliche Darstellungen, that is, perspicuous or surveyable models, sketches, pictures, representations of what he called our grammar, is a central tenet of his later philosophy. And I read it as a demand that philosophers turn their attention to writing. Insofar as there is an official view of the relation between language and writing in analytic philosophy and in contemporary linguistics, it's that language, thought of now as speech or the capacity for speech, and writing, thought of as a means of representing speech, has no interesting or important connection. Speech is biological, a trait of the species. It is genetically endowed and universal. Writing, in contrast, is a cultural innovation, a technology at most a few thousand years old. You don't need writing to talk. You don't need writing even to make poetry or song. You don't need writing in that sense for literary art. Most languages of the past were not written. And even today, many speakers are illiterate. If anything, so the official view would have it, writing gets in the way of a clear understanding of the nature of language. This is because writing, it's supposed, is an imperfect representation of speech. Writing systems may capture some features of spoken language, such as word order, but they leave others unmarked, such as phrase structure. For example, the way the and boy go together in the boy sings. Finally, writing as a cultural instrument for representing speech is conventional and prescriptive through and through. And this obscures the fact that language, as a natural phenomenon, so it is believed, is neither of these. Can this simple view of the relation of speech and writing do justice to the fact that there is such a thing as written language? No doubt its proponents believe that it can. We are language users by nature, they would say, writing as a technology for amplifying our natural linguistic capacities. Writing lets us talk to people who are beyond the reach of our voices or who are, who are unable to see our signing hands. Writing lets us record what we think for posterity. Writing lets us keep track of what we say or have said. And so it makes law and science and philosophy and politics possible. Writing, in the words of the biologist Ani Patel, is a transformational technology comparable to fire and the wheel, but it is a technology, a culturally transmitted innovation. Language itself, the capacity for speech, is natural, and it's a natural expression of innate, universal human nature. So the main problem with this view I've just characterized, with this simple view, is that it's too simple. Consider the statement that writing is a way of capturing, representing, and so extending speech. Not exactly, although that may be one of its uses. But we're also familiar with kinds of writing that are not, in the relevant sense, linguistic at all. Musical notation, to pick an obvious example, is a way of writing music. It's not a way of writing sentences. If it is a way of expressing thoughts, then these are distinctively musical thoughts. And something similar could be said, you tatis mutandis about mathematics and mathematical notations. It is very likely, this is the standard view among historians, I believe, that the alphabet itself evolved from earlier modes of mark making, whose purpose was not to encode or represent speech, but rather to keep score, or keep track, or tally, calculate, or count up. 
The first writers were accountants. They were recounters, but not narrators, whose tellings were confined to flocks and offspring. If this is correct, then writing speech, or written language, has its origins in modes of writing that are autonomous of language, not in the sense that these mode of writings could have been devised or put to work by people, by people incapable of speaking. That seems unlikely. I use the word autonomous first because whether or not such ways of writing are only put to work by people who can talk, they are not put to work in the cases I just described for purposes of talking or for representing what we do when we talk. They are not consequent on speech in the way that the simple view supposes that writing is consequent on dependent on speech. But second, and more profoundly, such writing devices are technologies for directly engaging and directly cognizing a world or a domain of interest. They do not engage the world or the domain by way of representing our linguistic ways of so doing. In this sense, they are on all fours with speech itself, and may be thought of in a way in their own right as kinds of languages. So there is now, and has been in the sense I'm articulating, language independent writing. Let's add to this the appreciation drawn from findings in archaeology and anthropology that speech is not more ancient than picture-making and other mark-making, scoring, or generally graphical activities. Indeed, it may very well be the case that, although it may very well be the case, that only a being capable of speech would also be capable of this kind of articulate mark-making, the same point can be made in reverse. Speech and writing, at least in an extended sense of pictoriality and mark-making, are as old as we are. Indeed, it is possible that the graphical is both more ancient and more fundamental. Animals make, they do, they act. But acting, making, doing of their very nature tend always to leave a mark. For example, by the very act of walking from here to there, again and again, our ancient ancestors would have in effect made roads, laid down paths in walking in the phrase poet. <coughs> it's hard even to think of acts of taking, holding, ingesting, excreting, or otherwise manipulating that would not manifestly alter and typically ornament or redesign the environment. Now, conscious experience, and here I'm referring to the focus of much of my work over the last decade or two, Conscious experience is active. It consists, I believe, in part, in the circular process, as Dewey might have put it, of doing and undergoing and keeping track the very expression of intelligence of the effects of the ways what one does affords opportunities for new doing and new undergoing. So let's take seriously the thought that human being, human consciousness, is graphical in my extended sense, in its origins and in its essence. We are mark makers, and making marks, leaving prints, is bound up with our fundamental character. It's suggested, if nothing more, to be reminded, as I recently was, that the first occurrences in ancient Greek of the word for line, or drawing, or writing, graphene, are actually used in reference to the cuts made on the body by a pointed arrow. So in our literary tradition, at least, the first writing is violent scarring. Writing or drawing is grounded in something basic and social, in this case, conflict. So where does this get us? Well, writing is one thing, speech is another. So far, so good for the simple view. And yes, without doubt, the use of writing for straightforwardly linguistic ends is a fairly late cultural innovation. But writing itself, in a more extended sense, 
of graphical activities, of scratching, scoring, marking, drawing, and maybe also spitting, spraying, cutting, stamping, soaking, antedates and is conceptually independent of its application to language. Moreover, writing, in this extended sense, may be, as I've suggested, no less bound up with human origins, and indeed with the origins of human consciousness, than language. So the pseudo-historical question with which I began becomes not, why and when did we invent writing for the purposes of speech, but rather, why did we at some point in our cultural history come to apply an already extant graphical toolkit to the case of speech, which is the problem of language? This is a thought that has been expressed by Gary Harris. Now, before trying to frame an answer to this, I want to direct our attention to an even more radical way in which the simple view may be too simple. And I'm sort of addressing some philosophers in the language if they're, if they're here. Let us grant that written language is modern and that speech is ancient. In this sense, at least, speech is prior to writing. This still leaves open the possibility that our concept of language, and so as a result, our experience of language, is writing dependent. A comparison with sex or sexuality may be helpful. We know that sex is old, I mean as a practice. Could anything be older? But it's also plain, I think, that how we experience sex, how we experience pleasure, desire, intimacy, our own bodies, but also reproduction, is organized by culture. And there are other instances where something natural is culturally transformed. In a longer version of this paper, I have a discussion of the ways in which practices of using and making pictures can transform what scene is. It's striking, I think, that we who are residents of the written language world find it so very natural to think of speech as something we can write down. For us, it's as if a written word on paper or on a computer screen or on a blackboard just is the word. It's the word's image or it's the word's face. And we find it natural seeming that words are the kinds of things that have spellings. We can write them down. You can't write down any old sound. We can't write down the floor's creak or the wind's whistle. Not exactly. Somebody said James Joyce can. Maybe James <laughs> Joyce can. Those sounds don't have spellings. But words come with spellings attached. So what comes first, the sounds or the letters in reference to which we pick out them as sounds? I want to suggest that sounds show up for us in the way they do in the context of language thanks to the ways we have learned to play with them or conceptualize them, and that writing in this setting is an important, maybe the important, instrument of conceptualization. C -a -t -c -a -t. C-A-T, cat. Do we have a grip on the sounds of that word apart from that thing we've learned? We don't stand outside of speech, as we might if we are transcribing the alien time when we stop. Spelling and other aspects of writing is something we do inside of language. Spelling, as Wittgenstein might have put it, is a language game. And that shouldn't really be that surprising. It's actually a remarkable thing, if you think about it, how, with what lockstep agreement and cultural unanimity, we train our young in this particular set of skills. Spelling, reading, writing from their earliest age and for the entire duration of their education. So this raises for me the question whether it is even possible for us to experience our own linguistic life, our own speaking and hearing, apart from the image of speaking and talking and hearing, which writing, or at least everything that goes with writing, supplies to us. 
And for me, this question is analogous to the question, would it be possible to experience our sexuality apart from the ways in which culture and religion and ideology and God knows what else have organized our sexual selves? Or, like asking, can we experience the visual world as if we did not live in a culture in which the visual world is an almost endless object of visual fiction? Or, for that matter, this question I'm posing relates to the more traditional philosophical debate, is there perceptual consciousness at all beyond the reach of our understanding? I think these questions are not psychological, they're ontological. Might it be that culture and history have transformed what sex or vision or language are? These are now, sex, vision, language, neither biological nor cultural, but biocultural, that is to say cultural <coughs> in nature. But the questions are also existential in the sense that we have to ask or, or, or grapple with the thought that it is just not a live possibility for us to engage in language apart from. We can't just sloth off and choose to be writing free in our relationship to the linguistic act, the purity of the linguistic act, a sort of a, 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 a writing, as it were, before culture, before writing. To do so would be like experiencing the body as if there had never been historically elaborated gender roles, or experiencing the movement of dance as if there had never been Fred Astaire, James Brown, or that boy in 10th grade who could do the robot. One of my aims in this presentation is to urge us to take seriously the hypothesis of this sort of entanglement. And for now, it seems to me this much is clear, keeping that um, focus on the case of language. Linguists carry on as if the speaker's or hearer's intuitions about grammaticality can be taken as data points and used to reverse engineer the nature of the underlying competence, which is the knowledge of language, a competence which is always asserted is supposed to be independent of writing and culture. But can we be so sure of that, that our intuitions do not in fact reflect the ways we have been embodied, or the, excuse me, the way we have embodied a sort of scriptoralist conception of language, that is a conception of language after writing, or according to the model of what language is, that writing itself makes available to us? Take the simple observation I mentioned before, um, that conventional alphabetic writing systems don't exhibit phrase structure, but that they do exhibit word order. That's true, but is that a fact that we have access to independently of our knowledge of written language? And how do we answer that question? It's an interesting kind of phenomenological slash psychological <coughs> problem. Is our sense that the and boy go together in the boy sings? Writing independent? So now with, with these preliminaries out of the way, I want to come back to this pseudo-historical question, how or why did we devise written language? Thank you, Professor. We've already considered, I think, what the simple view has to say about this, but I restate it. Written language is just so useful. As with the wheel and fire, the benefits of using it are sufficient to explain both how it came into existence and how it was maintained from generation to generation. But I, I hope I've said enough to begin to show why that can't be satisfactory, but let me, let me try to make it explicit. It's easy to see how we might apply our graphical know-how to the task of inscribing speech. If we already thought of speech as made up of structural elements that can be combined and recombined in a rule going way, but to think of speech that way is precisely to think of it already as something writable. Indeed, it's to think of speech and our capacity for speech in a way that may only first be made available to us conceptually, thanks to the availability of writing. But then it seems that we must already know how to write in order to invent writing. So writing was never invented. We've always been writing. So I'll refer to this as the writing paradox, and it's comparable to Plato's paradox of Mina, or Augustine's paradox of the teacher. The thing I need you to, to take into consideration now is that there are alternative ways of thinking about language 
than that which seems so obvious and unquestionable against the background of written language. Consider these kinds of facts. Speech is movement. It's skillful, purposeful, situation sensitive, social. Talking is something we do with others, and in doing so, we move our mouths and our throats, and we modulate our breathing and our rhythms, our posture, our orientation. Talking in this sense has more in common with playing soccer or maybe dancing than it does with sentences as they look printed on the page. How do we even get the idea of words and word order, phrases and phrase structure, out of that fluid exercise of task-oriented movement, which is language in the wild, as I might put it? Or take another example, dancing. How do you write dancing then? That's an interesting case because, in fact, there is a history within choreography of, of efforts to try to create choreographic scoring techniques and methods of writing dancing. By and large, this is a big topic I can't take up here because there's no time, but by and large, I think that those, those efforts to write dance have failed. Um, and we can sort of appreciate why just when you ask, how would you even begin? How would you even begin? to write what you're doing when you move. Now, you may be tempted to say that the difference between language and non-linguistic movement is that language is intrinsically and manifestly articulate. Its structure is made out of parts. And to be a language user is to be sensitive to this kind of articulation, <coughs> an articulation that shows up, for example, as Humboldt argued, at, at more than one level, at a semantic level, but also at a phonological and syntactic level. But cannot something similar be said about our bodies in action? Indeed, isn't the living animal body the very paradigm of something that articulates? So this much is clear. Language is a moving flow of human activity. To write it down, we must conceive of it as structured and differentiated in ways that we cannot do <coughs> without writing, or at least without something which plays something like the role of writing, something which is tantamount to writing, an attitude or stance that lets us think of what we're doing when we're speaking that way. To understand the place of writing in our linguistic lives, to frame an adequate concept of language, we need to come to grips with this paradox. And that's what I'm going to focus on for the remainder and it's in doing so that I'll make connection, direct connection with Bert's work. Um, my strategy is going to be roughly Augustinian or Platonic. I'll try to show that, in fact, we have always been writing, or more modestly, that we've always been engaged in something that's the moral equivalent of writing. And uh, for this reason, that we actually never do face off against speech, standing apart from it and wondering how we might ever figure out a way to write it down in the way that the paradox requires. Now, how can that be the case, that we've always been writing, if in fact we know, as a matter of fact, that the application of graphical technology to the question of language is an historically dated event? Okay. <clears throat> so to try to think about this question, to try to grapple with the paradox or answer it, I think it's useful for a moment to remind ourselves the way logicians think about what they call formal languages. A formal language, the sort of system that logicians work with, consists of a finite number of primitive or atomic symbols and a set of rules or procedures for determining for any string of these whether that string is also a well-formed formula. If it is, then good, and if it isn't, well, then it's prohibited by the rules. And so for meaning, there are assignments of meaning or semantic value to every primitive sign. <coughs> and there are rules for determining, given the meaning of the primitive signs, what the meaning or semantic value of each combination of signs is, each well-formed combination of signs is. If a sign lacks a proper assignment, or if the signs are combined illegally, then what you have is not so much meaningless language as it is non-language. A fair bit of philosophy of language and linguistics takes this conception of language for granted. Language, not now the language of the, of the 